Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Madhuri Ja. My pronouns are she, hers, and I am the director of the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity, an entity of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute here at the Morehouse School of Medicine. I see we are joined by people from all over the world, it looks like, so I'm very excited to welcome you. Uh, to our two-day speaker symposium entitled Mental Health Equity is Health Equity. I extend a vote of gratitude to the APA Foundation for sponsorship of our event. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers organized for you over the next two days we will, where we will tackle how behavioral health equity interfaces with policy and data, clinical services, and cultural humility. Our speakers represent a diverse and unique set of voices in the field and in the movement. While they are all leaders and experts, they are also people with lived experience. My vision as director of the center is that our programming is as equitable and inclusive as the system that we are working to change. Due to the volume of registrants we have logged into this Zoom, once the panels begin, we will be turning off the public chat and Q&A functions during our event. Um, however, you can privately contact our team using the chat and we will feature audience questions that we see come up with frequency. Without further ado, I would like us to begin our welcome remarks. It is my honor to introduce you to the founders of the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity. Dr. David Satcher, 16th Surgeon General of the United States, who will be followed by former Congressman Patrick J. Kennedy. After him, we will hear from my esteemed colleague, Executive Director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, Daniel Dawes, with final words from the Assistant Secretary from SANSA, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman. There will be a short break after the remarks, and then we will begin our first panel. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. I'm so happy to join in welcoming you to the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity Symposium. I can think of no topic which is more important or more relevant to our quest for health equity than this topic. I anticipate that this will be a very productive symposium and that we will all leave here better prepared and committed to mental health equity as well as to our role in the political process and the political determinants of health. So please enjoy the conference. And again, thank you for joining us. Okay. Well, first, thank you, Mallory, for your leadership. We're so honored that you have taken the helm, the Kennedy Satcher Center, and I want to thank my great friend, Daniel Dawes at the Morehouse School of Medicine Satcher Health Leadership and uh, President Montgomery Rice, just all of the great work that all of you have done. I wanna congratulate you on receiving the recognition from HHS to do that global research study on the impact of disparities against people of color as a result of COVID-19. And Morehouse is once again leading away and I'm so honored to have the Kennedy Satcher Center uh, right there, um, really where our civil rights movement got started in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I, I really think they're great parallels and, and Dr. Satcher has always brought this issue home to me when he talks about how he fought as a young man against the separate and unequal system of justice in our country and all the battles that he fought going to jail himself with Dr. King to, to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and then to fight to pass uh, the Voting Rights Act of 65. And then uh, with all of those who are fighting for equality, the, the march continued with fair housing, fair employment. And, and in spite of all of that, we know that we have not eradicated racism. Racism uh, tragically is still with us. And in pronounced ways, we have seen a series of Emmett Tills of our time uh, Trayvon uh, Martin, George Floyd, and many, many others. Too many to almost count. It's, it's such a stark reminder that we have a system in this country that is not relegated to one a police officer who harbors racism, but it's really a system uh, against uh, Black people and other people of color that has terrorized them in this country. And uh, we are learning firsthand, frankly, because COVID slowed our world down and made us look right in the eye of our own uh, shameful history of, of systemic racism to really appreciate that uh, there's a whole body of science around vicarious trauma, what it must be like to walk in the shoes 
of others who are regularly discriminated against, who are subject to microaggression simply because of the color of their skin. And I have always believed that that same bigotry in many respects is uh, also a legacy of outdated um, perspectives uh, on people with mental illness and addiction. And like with the civil rights battle, when we passed the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which was our medical version of civil rights, we too said separate and equal is unequal. And we have been fighting to integrate mental health into the house of medicine. And I wanna thank my good friend, Saul Levin from the American Psychiatric Association for really helping us to uh, kick this uh, webinar off and thank um, our, our Assistant Secretary for SAMHSA, Miriam Delphine Rittman, who has been a champion for these causes of mental health equity. Um, she now is in a position to really lift up those voices that have too long been silenced because of the inability for our current system to hear those who are crying out that our mental health system meet, needs to meet uh, the needs of all people in this country. And if it's not uh, culturally humble uh, and sensitive, it, then it also needs to reflect a, a growing number of therapists who look like the people that they're treating. That should be the future. And I know that is the work of uh, Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, let me also just thank all of those who are here today and to say, you know, just like with civil rights, uh, the, the work wasn't done when we passed the law. The work really just began because now it's enforcing uh, civil rights laws. Like we can't get rid of racism. We really can't get rid of bigotry towards people with mental illness and addiction. But what we can do is outlaw discrimination. What we can do, like with civil rights, is really enforce these anti-discriminatory statutes so that there isn't the kind of systemic discrimination like we continue to see against people with mental illness and addiction through violations in the parity law or even from the federal government through the fact that uh, with the new Medicare um, reform, it, it includes dental, it includes uh, vision, uh, but it doesn't include mental. There's still systemic discrimination in our largest insurance program in the country through the Public Health Act and, and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do to integrate mental health into our education system and to bring that kind of coping mechanism development, social emotional learning that's gonna be so crucial to helping our kids navigate the very difficult and treacherous uh, path forward in this volatile world that they're growing up in. Um, where there's so much polarization and so much trauma. We, we really need to get on our game. And, and so that's why I'm so happy that Madhuri, you are uh, helping and Daniel and, and Dr. Satcher um, and uh, President Rice and all those at Morehouse to really take this mission on. And I am so grateful for you to do that so that all Americans uh, can get the promise of mental health access and not have it be confined to just the few of us who've been fortunate enough to be able to pay for it in many respects out of pocket because there wasn't adequate coverage. That needs to change and, and it'll change with programs like we're um, pushing out with this webinar. And I thank you all for your participation. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. To all my fellow co-laborers in the fight for mental health equity, I want to thank you for joining us today. I'd especially like to recognize and thank our Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity Director, Madri Jha, for leading this important dialogue since joining the Satcher Health Leadership Institute team. And I also want to acknowledge and thank our partners at the Kennedy Forum, especially the Honorable Patrick J. Kennedy and the American Psychiatric Association, who have so graciously supported our initiative to address the many barriers that continue to persist for people living with behavioral and mental health conditions. This is an issue that is near and dear to me. I know that mental health is a critical but underrated issue in health policy. It is too often overlooked or completely omitted 
from the equity conversation. In my role as the executive director of the Satrap Leadership Institute, I prioritized this neglected area of health and strategically incorporated it into one of three pillars that drive our mission to create systemic change at the intersection of policy and equity. Let us remember that in 1999, our namesake and the founding director, Dr. David Satcher, was the first U.S. Surgeon General to ever report on mental health. This year marks the 20th anniversary of that landmark report, which brought to light that culture, race, and ethnicity play an integral role in mental health outcomes. Together, aligning this passion with former U.S. Representative Patrick J. Kennedy, the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity was created to promote health equity for people living with mental health and substance use disorders. We hope that this symposium will foster an environment of knowledge exchange, innovation, deeper collaboration, and create actionable policy-driven solutions that will elevate and ultimately move the needle of mental health equity for all. Thank you all so much again for your unwavering commitment and exceptional leadership in this quest for mental health equity and justice. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman and I join you today as the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I'm so pleased to welcome you to Morehouse's Mental Health Equity is Health Equity Symposium. The conference's theme today has a strong connection with my career in behavioral health and equity that will continue while I'm at SAMHSA. Prior to taking on my current role at SAMHSA, I served as the commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services for six years. As commissioner, I was committed to promoting recovery-oriented, integrated, and culturally responsive services and systems that foster dignity, respect, and meaningful community inclusion. In May 2012 to 2014, I completed a two-year White House appointment, working as a senior advisor to the administrator of SAMHSA, during this time, I worked on a range of policy initiatives addressing behavioral health equity, workforce development, and healthcare reform. I want to take an opportunity to give you a quick snapshot of where SAMHSA stands today and how our work impacts behavioral health equity, which includes mental health equity. Our overarching mission is to mitigate and reduce the impact of substance use and mental illness across America. While SAMHSA is undertaking a more robust strategic planning process, we have identified five core near-term priorities that will guide our efforts and our broader, as our broader strategic planning process takes shape. The five priorities are preventing overdose, enhancing access to suicide prevention and crisis care, promoting children and youth behavioral health, integrating primary care and behavioral health care, and using performance measures, data, and evaluation. In addition to these five priorities, we have also outlined four critical cross-cutting principles around equity, workforce, financing, and recovery. In the context of today's symposium, SAMHSA is working to ensure that there is a broader and more inclusive public awareness about mental illness and mental health issues through our communications and that access to mental health services are equitable. This means that in our work in prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery, we need to consider a person's culture and language and the community in which they come from when we do our work. We are working with our HHS colleagues to continue to push forward the national standards for culturally and linguistically appropriate services in health and healthcare, also known as the national class standards. One of our recent efforts in collaboration with the HHS Office of, Office of Minority Health is the Behavioral Health Implementation Guide for the National Class Standards. You will be able to download this guide on SAMHSA's website. The guide provides concrete, feasible implementation strategies to behavioral healthcare communities to improve the provision of services to all individuals, regardless of race, ethnicity, language, socioeconomic status, and other cultural characteristics. We know that there is no health without mental health. Likewise, we know that there is no health equity without mental health equity. Together, we must work towards restoring our systems and expanding our nation's treatment and recovery support systems permanently. 
Now more than ever, these are matters of life and death. As COVID-19 has shown, disparities persist and have widened in some cases with the pandemic. So we must act now and we must act together. Lastly, I wanna acknowledge that September is National Recovery Month, as well as National Suicide Prevention Month. Many of you in today's audience are heroes and sheroes who are working every day to prevent suicide and promote recovery. I would like to thank you all in the audience for the tireless work you do to serve communities in behavioral health. Thank you. So welcome everyone to our first panel. I hope you all felt just as moved by those inspirational remarks from our leaders in solidarity as I did. I believe the tone has really been set to begin this first discussion we'll have um, with our esteemed panelists who I'm so thrilled to join us on how policies and data collection can help or harm the movement to make the mental health system, behavioral health system more equitable. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our five panelists for this session. We have David Lloyd, who is policy director for the Kennedy Forum and a national expert on mental health and substance use parity. We have Dr. Mary Rory, who is the director for behavioral health equity at SAMHSA. We have Ms. Kristen Tolliver, who is the region 14 director at the Georgia Division of Family and Child Services. We have Ms. LaShawn Robinson, Deputy Chancellor of Climate Wellness at the New York City Department of Education. And we have Dr. Octavio Martinez, Executive Director for the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health and a leading expert in community psychiatry and minority health disparities. Welcome to all of you and thank you so much for joining me today for this important discussion. Just some admin, admin items before we get started. As we go through these questions, I will ask you all to think about your role the population you serve and how it translates to mental health equity. But I also encourage you to channel your own identity and how it influences your work and ability to achieve equitable access for all. A reminder is that you can use the raise hand function to be looped into a question that I may direct to one of your peers if you have an appropriate follow-up. Everyone okay? All righty. So let's get started. David, I'm actually going to begin with you for our first question. Um, you are an expert in mental health and substance use parity policy. Can you tell our audience a bit about how you feel parity affects access to mental health care and, and what we can do to improve those policies? Sure, well, you know, I think parity is fundamental to um, you know, everything we do because it's all about equity. And it's all about the financing of these services. And without financing of mental health and addiction services, they simply won't occur. Um, and frankly, we've had uh, you know, generations of discriminatory financing uh, of mental health and addiction services that has disproportionately affected uh, you know, those uh, among us um, who have the least resources. And those tend to be uh, you know, black communities, Latinx communities and communities of color. So the fact that we haven't financed these services by enforcing the Federal Parity Act, and frankly, having the Federal Parity Act extend to all the health, you know, health coverage across the country, um, you know, means that uh, we don't have enough services, we don't prioritize prevention, and ultimately people don't get the, the care they need. And often we have very poor, uh, poor outcomes that are very inequitable. So, you know, I think as uh, former Congressman uh, Patrick Kennedy talked about in his opening remarks, we need to enforce the Federal Parity Act, but we also need to go much further in ensuring that the Federal Parity Act is expanded um, to all of Medicare. It doesn't apply to Medicare at all and doesn't apply to traditional uh, Medicaid uh, or TRICARE. Um, and we also see that uh, many you know, state and local governments can opt out of the Federal Parity Act, um, which is a major issue um, that we need to address. And we see that the entire state of Michigan, state of Utah, um, also the entire University of Texas system has opted out of the Federal Parity Act. And in these uh, employers have very diverse populations compared to many private sector employers. So that's certainly a loophole that we need to fix. But you know, without equitable financing, we simply won't see the services that we you know, need to see, and we won't uh, be focused on prevention in the way that we need to be focused on prevention. Uh, so happy to be here, and uh, thank you so much for having this really important panel. You bring up an excellent point about what equitable financing means, and, and Dr. Rory, it, it makes me think about your role now as not so new anymore, the, but the Director of Behavioral Health Equity at SAMHSA. You know, from your perspective, kind of piggybacking off of David's point, what do you think are points of urgency right now, you know, when you think about a national agenda for equity? 
Wow, <laughs> that's a big question and loads of answer. But first, let me thank you for having us. And the conversation started moments ago. So everything that has been said, in addition to what David just said, I'll add this, and I'm gonna be very blunt. We need to start early in the mom's womb. Prevention is key. Whatever it is in the first place, if we catch it, then we can save that money, reinvest it into better schools, healthcare, et cetera, later. We need to increase screening. We need to have that same campaign that we had for smoking. Are we got everybody to stop smoking? We need to let people know it's okay to say there's something wrong. It's okay to say something's wrong and we can get you some help. And we don't care if you're black, white, rich, poor, small, big. it does not matter. That's what equity is all about. And that's what I would add. We have to act now. Fabulous. And LaShawn, you, you took my transition. I, I was going to go to you and Kristen, because both of you have very unique roles working with you know, children and families in, in your capacities. And Dr. Rory excellently brought up, like, what does it mean to start from the womb? So LaShawn, I'll go to you first. And then, you know, Kristen, I'll ask you to speak on this also. Absolutely. I had to jump in um, on what Dr. Rory shared about starting early. I'm happy to be here from the New York City Department of Education, the largest school district in the nation, where we support over 1 million beautiful, brilliant children, over 80% identify as black and brown. Uh, we have about 15% that identify as multilingual learners, 20% uh, students with disabilities, 70% are economically uh, disadvantaged and 100,000 young people and their families identify as residing in temporary housing. So that's the landscape of the work. And Dr. Rory, when you shared about starting early, we must, must remove barriers to care by increasing access in school settings and in the communities. In New York City, an example of this is really ensuring robust school-based supports, such as school-based mental health clinics. We have over 300 schools where they have mental health in the school setting. I'm a parent of um, a recent graduate from our New York City public schools and to have the mental health clinic with the school-based health clinic right in the school setting has just been transformative in terms of access. That's the kind of work that we need to do. We have community schools with mental health resources, partnerships with local mental health clinics, all removing barriers to care and increasing access for our youngest New Yorkers. That's fundamental, that is so important. Um, in our school system, we conduct eye exams and dental exams, and we provide follow-up resources. We must focus on mental health and wellness with the same level of priority care. This is how we begin to reduce stigma and normalize mental health and wellness right in our schools. We must also provide foundational mental health support through social emotional programming in schools. We have physical education because we believe that exercise and movement help young people to live healthier lives. In a similar fashion, we must invest in social emotional learning programming because that uh, when young people are seen, heard, and understood and have opportunities to express their emotions and build healthy relationships, mm -hmm. they are healthier emotionally. They're more engaged in school and they're academically successful. So these are examples that I would lift that's connected to starting early. Thank you for lifting that, Dr. Rory. Fantastic. Hi. And so many, so many excellent points you've brought up and sort of, you know, makes me think of like my work with my with children and how much actually happens at the school, right? The school is just so much more than the classroom and definitely stems into your work, Kristen, you know, working here in Atlanta and in Georgia with children and families and child welfare. You know, what what do you feel when you hear Dr. Rory, LaShawn, David, what comes to mind for you? Thank you so much um, first for having me um, and listening to what everyone said, I think is so critical, especially working in the um, child welfare system to use a system of care approach. A lot of times we're working in silos. You have the school system, you have um, defects, what we call defects, division of 
Children and Family Services, then you have DBHDD, and those entities by itself are so hard to maneuver that our parents in the community often can't find resources to um, be able to tackle those mental health challenges that they have or their children may have. So what we're doing at the agency is making sure that we're collaborating and that we're partnering with our sister agencies to bring mental health awareness to the forefront. And it isn't until we're able to do that that we get the abundance of quality services that really meet the needs as it relates to um, mental health of the kids in the child welfare system. Excellent. You know, Dr. Martinez, you are based in San Antonio, Texas, although I know you've had a national reach, but one of the things I'm curious to loop you into is also what it's like in geographically for us to think about these issues. You know, your work in Texas, Texas being so diverse in terms of geographic landscape, you have some huge urban centers, and then you also have very rural areas. You know, where do you think we can pull the rural landscape into this discussion? Oh, absolutely. I think it's important. First, uh, just like everyone else, thank you to uh, uh, the invitation to join you guys and to be with these uh, fantastic colleagues. You've all made such wonderful points. To your point, my jury, though, um, we are actually, the Hawk Foundation for Mental Health is actually uh, literally based in Austin. Uh, uh, however, I do actually have uh, medical appointments in San Antonio and Austin. So, uh, But we look at the entire state, to your point. And, and Texas um, uh, is very unique in the fact that one, it's the largest landmass state outside of Alaska, right? Uh, uh, which is also just huge. And so we do have a very urban metro areas, rural and even pioneer areas still in the state of Texas where very few folks, you know, in density out in West Texas and some of the panhandle counties that we have. What that brings to mind though, and it's thinking about mental health equity uh, is the fact that we can't use a cookie cutter approach and often what we do is we concentrate for good reason because of density in metro and urban areas. And those are usually our solutions and our thoughts and how we approach things mm -hmm. versus thinking about, okay, rural, it's a little bit different and even pioneer settings or like states like the state of Texas that are, that are juxtaposed to another nation. So we have a very interesting also frontera, also known as the you know, Texas-Mexico border, right? Of course, there's the US-Mexico border. And all of those bring to, the, to, 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 to bear is the different factors, the different resources that our communities have. And I think that's what's one key thing that we need to keep in mind is what we need to also not think about just a systems level approach of top down, but let us also be partnering with and going to and working with our communities who know best what they need, right? However, they are challenged at times when it comes to the equity equation, which is, are we ensuring that folks that have been historically marginalized are being brought to the table? But there are models out there of how to do this. that I think at the federal level, the state level, county and city and so forth, all our different governmental institutions and approaches, we can infuse a community-centric model to be able to approach and come up with community-centric solutions and bring the concepts and ensure that equity is at the table, that we are addressing our health disparities and that we're recognizing what are those social determinants that are impacting them? And that social determinants that may be very relevant in a rural setting may be re a different priority, same social determinants, but the priority may be diff different in a say an urban setting of what is most important, even though we know that all of them are really are everything from housing to food insecurity and et cetera, that I know my co colleagues here are very much aware of. But that's what comes to mind, Mary, when you, when you bring that question, is let us be community-centered and work with communities. Together, we can definitely come up with solutions. I think that the concept of community-centric is really meaningful here, too, because Obviously, you know, my mind goes to a discussion on data, right? Well, I think we all know in our work that communities of color, marginalized folks, native folks, folks in the LGBTQ plus community have felt very left out of the conversation, but even further, participation in the data collection process is a longstanding issue. And then we also know that data is what informs policy. It, it's what a legislator looks at to say, this is why I need to care about this issue and put this forward. Um, so what does, that's a great, it's a great phrase you brought up. What does community centric mean in terms of the future of data collection? Um, and I'll, David, I'll, I'll go to you first, you know, because of your national reach. What do you think of that? 
Sure. So, you know, from my perspective, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a researcher or clinician, but, you know, the, the data that we have is really actually pretty terrible um, across the country. And we really have a pretty atrocious public health data. And that is kind of across the board as the pandemic has you know, shown in many respects. But for mental health and, and substance use, it's particularly bad. And there's very limited uh, data you know, relating to um, you know, communities of color and LGBTQ uh, populations. And that needs to change. And it frankly needs to be, you know, it needs to be collected at the local level, but it also needs to be standardized uh, across the country. Um, you know, one of the things that we see, and I've done a little bit of a deep dive over this over the past, you know, half year, um, is just looking at mortality data um, relating to mental health and substance use. And it's really bad and it's really fragmented. And there's, um, you know, you have all of these jurisdictions collecting data in a non-standardized way. And it's very, uh, we're often very late in getting it. So, you know, we, we find many months after the fact that, uh, or even year after, years after the fact, uh, that certain bad outcomes have happened. And that's not a way to make public policy. So, you know, we really do need to be, um, you know, collecting data at the local level and having robust public health systems, but we need to be doing it in a standardized way so that we can actually make meaningful conclusions. Excellent. I, I agree. You know, I think I'm noticing everybody's going like this with their head that the standardization, it, it would be the gold standard. And yet we know we have challenges too, if even at the engagement process, right? So I saw LaShawn's hand first, and then I'll go to Dr. Martinez. And I, I just wanted to talk about this from a slightly different perspective um, about increasing the visibility of marginalized groups um, from a, a data uh, collection perspective. Um, I think we have to also value and honor the lived experience and the stories of um, many groups. I think we can increase our use of storytelling as a valid source of data. And it's empowering for communities to be able to tell their stories and to amplify their voices. Um, I just in my own experience being here in New York City um, under the leadership of uh, First Lady Charlene McRae, who's just such a champion and an advocate for mental health work. Um, as a Black woman in the city before I was in this role, just looking up to her and hearing her tell her lived experience and share her story about what she was going through within her own family made me feel um, the power of telling my own story, moving away from the hurt and shame and using my voice as a voice of advocacy. I think that is so important that we start to really transform what we mean um, when we say data and to honor the lived experience as a part of that data. That's a way for us as policymakers to humanize um, the approach and to really look at data sets from a different lens. Within our own work, when I started in this capacity um, in the Department of Education, um, we collected a lot of data like school incidents or suspensions, and we shifted that lens and started to look at positive supports and interventions. And once we shifted that lens across our school system, we started to see an increase in positive supports and interventions and a decrease in you know, school-based incidents and suspensions. So we really need to really transform what we mean when we say data and start to collect a lot of um, the positive indicators as well. I, I think also what you're speaking to, so in, in, I'm a social work professional, I'm an LCSW by training, and, and we talk about what it means to be strengths-based. And that's kind of what you're also highlighting, right? Is that we are focusing on things that we can leverage, that we can use. One of our one of our panelists, Dr. Clark, for the next uh, uh, session actually made a good point too that we have not done what we need to do with the data we have. With regard to the healthcare sector, behavioral health was excluded from EHR incentives, which is a huge point. You know, the title of this symposium is Mental Health Equity is Health Equity for exactly that reason, that we cannot leave behavioral health outcomes out of the equation. It has to be seen as part of it. Um, before I go to Dr. Martinez, you know, a bunch of our participants actually asked how many of panelists over these two days would consider ourselves people with lived experience. It's making me think, LaShawn, of your, your comment there. Out of a show of hands, if anybody's willing to share, how many of you would consider yourself someone with lived experience? 
all of us, right? All of us. And I think part of this is that we, we all have a reason why we entered this field and it's a personal conviction we have to be a part of this movement. So I, I really appreciate you, you bringing that into this, the humanity piece, LaShawn, into this conversation. So Dr. Martinez, I'll, I'll go to you next. <clears throat> Yeah, I love what LaShawn uh, said about contextualizing the data. I think that's so important. She's right about uh, we need to use uh, stories. Um, data, uh, and, and I did see the, the message from, uh, from Dr. Clark, uh, but data is still very important. We do need to have it because as we well know in the policy arena, if you don't have data, the issue don't exist. Exactly. Okay, right? So, uh, and to Dan, David's point, uh, we're still struggling with just with race and ethnicity and, and language data. The very basics, let alone what we also need to start doing, is really also gathering, uh, you know, equity metric data. And I know that Morehouse School of Medicine is very much working on this issue on behalf of the country. But the other one I just want to throw in before we go to Mary uh, is, uh, and bringing up what you brought up uh, earlier, Montero, when you asked me about rural, uh, you know, outside of our urban and metro areas, it makes me think about how many of our communities of color are often seen as monolithic. So what we need to be doing is disaggregate a lot of the data to be able to really address the real issues that are happening. For example, for our Native American you know, uh, communities out there, or we're looking at even, especially in uh, you know, Asian American communities and how mo monolithic that is. I mean, Indian American versus Chinese American versus Hmong, I mean, the list goes on, right? Same thing even within the Hispanic community. So the disaggregation, I think that needs to be part of the standardized, not data, but standardized process. We are smart folks, we know how to do this. We need to stop saying, oh, we can't really address that issue because there's just not enough of that population base to make any type of extrapolations and then be able to make you know, evidence-informed, data-informed decisions. Not true. We, we have the methodology and we need to start actually implementing it. Right, and, and you're speaking to sort of when we think about standardization, I think one of the pitfalls of trying to utilize a standardized uh, uh, tool, for example, is census data is one thing I think of in terms of how people demographically identify and how many limitations there are. I'm South Asian. So South Asians actually didn't exist on the US census till 2010. Um, so we didn't actually count and we had no way of identifying ourselves when we took the census and then there was some discussion around that. But as those continue to be the tools, I think one thing we can share with our audience is to advocate for a broader spectrum of ways people can identify. So this challenge of being monolithic can start to be dismantled a bit, definitely. So Dr. Rory, I'll go to you and then Kristen, I'll come next. <clears throat> I'm so passionate about this. I'm gonna try to keep this comment to a minute. Location, location, location data, data, and even more data. We cannot move or change anything without data. So for our audience, for ourselves, if we don't get that right, we're not gonna make it. Now, let me tell you why. So the data will drive the policy. The policy will drive the increase in needed funding that will drive sustainability change on the ground, right? And don't forget about the importance of the data. It's nice to say that you've made a difference. It's even more powerful when you have collected, tracked, cleaned, analyzed, published, and disseminated the data and its findings. This is also called a call for action in an acceptable, accessible format for all to understand from the affected participant to the White House. We're not leaving no stones unturned here. That's what I'm gonna say about the data. Additionally, at SAMHSA, we're working. We have the National Survey on Drug Use and Health Tool. It collects data, we're refining it. We're working really hard to make sure that the data is consistent. We're trying to make sure that we get the race, ethnicity, LGBTQ plus IA rule, homeless. We're trying to cover it all. It takes time. Now, here's the biggest thing I wanna say. Who's willing to volunteer to monitor? And I don't want to say the word policing, but I'm going to say it here to make sure that these things are happening on the ground. That's what we're working on also. We have a program called Elevate CBOs, Elevate Community-Based Organizations. So stay tuned. It's coming out soon. Thank you.
Thank you. And and I and the and the fervor is important, right? I think part of this to uh, another panelist mentioned, you know, American Indian Alaska Natives, for example, uh, due to data sovereignty for some reasons, and then the long-standing just disservice we've done to the Native community in terms of being represented in the 500 plus tribes that we have here in the United States are often listed as other. And so we have this huge challenge where at the Satcher Institute, we say, if there's no data, there's no problem, right? So if there's no evidence of it, no one sees it as an issue. And at the national scale in terms of policy, why, so we have grossly underfunded initiatives you know, that come forward because the problem doesn't, air quotes, of course, exist. Kristen, I'm, I'm curious to hear where you fit into this discussion in your role here in Georgia. <clears throat> So I was going to say we have to be um, like much what uh, Dr. Rory mentioned, data is very critical, but we have to be so intentional about what we do with the data. We collect data and then oftentimes our you know, clients don't see the effects of how did this data or this survey benefit me. So when we're collecting that data, we have to make sure because there's such a small window when you talk about people of color when collecting data because mental health is such a stigma. What are we going to do with that data? What interventions and what strategies are put in place to make my life better um, based off the data that you all collected? So when we start talking about data, again, I think we have to be very intentional about the results of that data and what are we actually doing about the data that we collected? So I just you know, wanted to put that out there because a lot of times in the child welfare system, we will, we collect a lot of data, a lot of surveys and our children will say, you know, not one more time will I do another survey because I don't see the effects of it. So I do want to make sure that we all, you know, keep that in the forefront of making sure that we're communicating once we've collected that data. These are the things that we're gonna be put in place and this is how it is going to better the community or not. Or, you know, we put something in place and it didn't work, but this is what we're gonna tweak to make sure that it is beneficial. Absolutely. And I think also, you know, we always talk about what patient-centered care means, you know, if, if you are a clinical provider, even if you're interested in the social services. And if people who are consumers of our system don't understand what they're participating in as well, I think that's part of the problem. And then, of course, in, in many communities, especially communities of color, there's a huge distrust of where that information will go, where is it being utilized. And as much as we'd like to say we've made that progress, it's evident, obviously, in this discussion, we haven't, right? We haven't. Um, David, you know, in your mind, there's, there's a lot of forthcoming legislation, I think, that is an effort to try and mitigate some of these challenges that we have coming up. One I'm thinking of is definitely 988, right? We have to discuss what the implications of something like 988 is. And for our audience members who don't know, um, projected in July 2022 is supposed to be the rollout of a national emergency line, much like 911. Uh, that'll be utilized for someone having a psychiatric crisis. And so rather than having a police response to that, um, we would have a medical emergency psychiatric response to that person. It is still in the works. There is a lot that we, I think we can talk about here, right? So this is a national policy and a national rollout influenced by data, by buy-in, by, by funding, by geographic location to unpack. So to go back to my question, David, you know, in your mind legislatively, what is a critical next step for us to be really thoughtful of groups that are historically left out of the discussion, right? Historically left out of, of policies. Yeah, so I, I think it, with 988, you hit on a critical uh, you know, new uh, uh, policy kind of initiative and push that we need to make in systemic reform. And we have to make sure uh, that uh, as we're building a, a mental health crisis response system that we'll need to surround the new three digit, uh, well, it's not a new, the, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline already exists. It's just a 10 digit number. And this will be a three digit number that will be that is live nationwide by next uh, July, 2022. And as we build a system to surround 988 with mental health crisis response and stabilization, we need to ensure that communities, uh, particularly communities of color are at the center of those conversations. Now there, there need to be federal resources that are coming down um, you know, to help build that system up, but states and localities also need to add. Um, states have to put in place uh, a, a telecommunications fee in order to fund these services, as well as those new Medicaid matching dollars that they need to you know, utilize. 
Um, but you know, th this cannot occur and we can't build the system that we actually need without really engaging communities and providers uh, on the ground. So we both need it being top down with the resources coming, uh, but also from, uh, from the bottom up. And we also, you know, with 988, have to have broader conversations with a broader array of stakeholders beyond just, uh, you know, our behavioral health, um, you know, community. Um, we need to have uh, conversations with advocates, uh, in the, you know, who are working on criminal legal system uh, reforms. We need to have, you know, conversations um, with uh, people who are affected um, by the juvenile justice system and the criminal you know, legal system. Um, in order to actually create a system that uh, meets communities' needs. So I think this is a very exciting area, um, but uh, an area that uh, you know, currently we don't have a system uh, that functions very well. In fact, it often leads to tragedy and death with a law enforcement-centered response uh, to mental health crisis. Absolutely. And, and uh, Dr. Martinez, you beat me to it because I was going to ask you, and so if this is part of your answer, please, but also uh, as an ad, you know, it makes me think of cross-sector collaboration, right? What does that really look like? Again, title, mental health equity is health equity because of exactly what you're speaking of, David. I think behavioral health is often a siloed uh, approach to looking at it as a, a single issue problem when we realize behavioral health interfaces with all facets of our life. Um, and so it requires that conversation. So Dr. Martinez, please, you know, what do you say? <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a really great point. Really great uh, answer by David as well for 98. I think that um, uh, there's huge potential here. Really excited about the fact that 98 is coming down the pike and finally is gonna be there. Um, and, and it does go to very much what you say, my, my theory, where we're gonna have, uh, it really, to have a robust 98 system, <laughs> It's really going to take cross-system collaboration, absolutely. And, and what really excites me about this is that we can decriminalize a great deal of how we respond to crisis right now, because it comes through the 911 system, right? And 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 you think your your families are thinking, I'm I'm asking for a, a crisis intervention. I want help. They're not expecting the police to show up and to take their loved one away and incarcerate them. That wasn't why they called 911. They saw it as an emergency, as a crisis, and they were expecting to have help and resources and to de-escalate the issue, whatever the issue may be, but result in then it then being followed up with the kind of care that is needed from a humanistic standpoint, but also from a physical and mental health standpoint. Because as we know, uh, one of the things about you know equity is really the understanding, the understanding the biological underpinning of us as human beings. There really is no difference between physical ailments and mental health ailments. We created those silos and artificial constructs. And there's a whole lot of reasons we can think of policy-wise. A lot of it has to do with money. But it's really actually a red herring, in my opinion, because the mind and body are so interrelated. And so should be our response to crisis. And so we should have mobile crisis units that go out initially first to take care of these 988 calls and, 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 hope, and what should be happening also cross unit collaboration between 988 and 911. So if a call does come to 911, it's really should be a 988. You have a simple and, and smooth process to ensure it's the 988 mobile crisis team that's going to go out. Now, if the mobile crisis team goes out and a mobile crisis team for our audience would include initially first responders that are our police or our sheriffs, but it really should be a group that it knows how to de-escalate and work with a mental health or substance use crisis. If they then feel that there is an issue that needs to be addressed where maybe uh, we need a protection for the individual or for others, well, then we need to be working together to ensure that happens. But we, do, we already know some pilots that have been done out there like in Oregon and other states, when it comes to mobile crisis units, almost over 90% of them end up being, there's no need for police to be there or a presence of force. What you really need is individuals skilled in crisis intervention who can de-escalate and then be able to get you to the resources that you so woefully need or the individual does, or maybe it's the family unit. And often uh, we, we know we can do that, but to be able to do that, we really need to be able to be, as David said, interfacing well with uh, our, our um, our police, our criminal justice system, as well as uh, with our educational system, and and indeed also with you know our public health infrastructure and the healthcare system. So many of our systems need to come together to have a robust and I think approach to crises. 
uh, because, uh, and I'll just add this one thing, and and because I see Mary's got her hand up, um, that not you know majority of the time when we think it's a mental health crisis, often it can be, but there may be some really important physical underpinnings that can also be present of why that also needs to be evaluated and ensure that there's not an individual maybe who is in fact uh, you know in the throes of a, of a diabetic ketoacidosis, where often their behavior can can mimic other types of, of illnesses that we experience as human beings. And so having a well-designed, uh, well-skilled uh, group of individuals who can come in and help a family or an individual, uh, that would just be just a, just a really wonderful and optimal. And that's where I hope we're going now with 988. I think too, what you're speaking to is trust. You know, I mean, those of us who are clinicians here, I can speak for myself. So I was a mobile unit director in New York before I took this appointment. And uh, how many times you've been present where the panic, the sheer panic that an unwell person feels when you say, I have to call 911 to get you the help because their fear of the traumatization they will go through by the system as a result, right? And so I think, you know, one of our, one of our uh, attendees has asked a, a very important question is ensuring that 988 and other interventions are, are culturally sensitive and are a- appropriate. Um, they're linguistically appropriate. They are regionally appropriate. They are humanistically appropriate, right? That we, we're, we're putting people, perhaps you look like the, the person or come from the same community that are able to create a, a, a body of trust for someone to feel like they are safe. I think these are things, this is why this discussion is important because if we talk about equity, this is really what we mean. So Andrea, Dr. Worry, I, go ahead. Can I just add one thing? Just one word and then we'll go to Mary. Uh, everything you said, absolutely. And including, we should be trauma informed. We shouldn't yeah. be adding to. Remember first do no harm. Correct, absolutely. So Dr. Rory, you and then Kristen. <clears throat> I'll try to do this in 20 seconds. So. <laughs> You talked about cross collaboration. No man is an island to himself. So we all know that. And so we worked with the National Academies of Science, Engineer and Medicine. And we just put in a two day workshop back in July on strategies and interventions to reduce suicide, a virtual workshop, much like what we're doing here on 988. And when I tell you that as part of that committee, I was everything, I was black, I was poor, white, rural. I was disabled. I was LGBTQI. I was whole, I was everything I needed to be. And every sector that I just listed was there for those two days of workshops. We were able to say 988, that's nice. 911, that's nice. We got a connection. We got to see years of data, whatever. But we don't have that time. Every 40 seconds in the United States, somebody dies of suicide. I'm going to say what I said at the beginning. Prevention is key. Let's prevent it before it even happens. So resources not only need to go there to be culturally relevant, respectful, sensitive, we got to try to prevent it in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Kristen, you had your hand up. I did, and, and Dr. Rory kind of touched on it. I, I think we also have to be transparent to say how serious are we about this, especially when we talk about the mobile, mobile crisis um, unit. Are we going to put the funding behind it that it needs? Because we have that here in Georgia too, but it may take, I've seen it take a, pa- a parent call and it take three to four hours just to get the um, mobile crisis unit to come. And even when they come, sometimes the mobile crisis unit will call the police. So we have to be very, um, I think, transparent in the conversation. How serious are we about this? And are we going to pour the funding in uh, or behind mental health that we should as we're doing um, with other programs? And I think also, I know a passion of yours, Kristen, is ensuring that we're not, especially with children, for example, you know, overdiagnosis, over medicalization of mental wellness concerns are still a longstanding challenge that we have, right? And ensuring that we have, we strike a balance between having a trauma-informed lens in the way that we help people, but then in getting them the care they need, but not ensuring that, again, it's punitive. We have this criminalization of someone's mental health status and and what that looks like. So David, uh, I see you, and then LaShawn. Yeah, just one uh, one quick uh, comment, and I can't resist uh, the opportunity um, so there, is, in terms of data in 988, we actually don't know how much money we need for 988, in part, and I, I'm going to look at you, Dr. Gorey, just because you're the representative from SAMHSA, because there's a very overdue report from SAMHSA 
that hasn't yet come out, which the advocates are kind of, you know, we're kind of shrugging that we, it's very difficult to make the case without the report. So uh, just um, if we can get that report, it would be great. Thank you. I wanted to um, go back to a point that Kristen made um, earlier about a trauma-informed lens, um, especially when we're working with our young people and ensuring that um, thinking about this work from an environmental lens um, and ensuring that everyone within that school setting has a trauma-informed lens from the first person that greets that young person and family um, in the morning to the school secretary, the teacher, the cafeteria worker, the school custodian. How do we ensure that every single person that touches that child throughout the day has this trauma-informed lens with the ability to um, identify trauma, ensure that that young person's needs are met within that school setting. So again, ensuring that high quality mental health resources are accessible at the school setting or in the community. But it has to be everyone that's touching that young person. And from the, the lens of culturally responsive practices, we have to honor families and understand that parents and families, they know their children best we should learn from them about the needs of young people from a mental health and wellness perspective and fully recognize that we don't know everything. We know a lot, but we don't know everything. And how do we honor families as leaders in this space from that culturally responsive lens? We have to center their voices and center their experiences. Absolutely. Dr. Martinez, sounds like you've got something to add. <clears throat> I wanted to pick up a point uh, Kristen brought up, which I think is extremely relevant and point and important as we're thinking about data and policy. Uh, and it's often what, what is told is, you know, this is too expensive. Uh, we can't, that's not in the budget. Uh, and, and we often philosophically, we look at things as an expense instead of looking at it as an investment, an investment in ourselves, an investment in humanity. But to the point about the fact we're a capitalist society and we put money where we value it. So we know that mental health, unfortunately, is not valued as often as it should and as equitably it should because it doesn't get the budget. However, I think that's where we still need to, through data and good research, through health economists, we can show the savings that can happen. One of the things we have to, though, uh, deal with, though, is that the savings often is at a systems level. That's where the cross-unit collaboration or cross-systems uh, you know, coordination is so important. So if you have a mobile crisis unit, say through 98, and it's having the impact that it has, say like the CAHOOTS model out, out in Oregon, you're going to actually then have savings happening in your police force where they're not the ones actually going out and taking care of these issues anymore as time goes by and, and as the systems mature. The same can be said in rural settings, which is also very important, where we know, at least here in Texas, we have in the Texas Church Association, when they have to take a deputy offline because they have to deal with a mental health crisis. And then if they need to be transported to under an order of protective custody, say to, you know, a crisis unit, uh, how much that actually costs and how much of an impact it has overall. But if they are not having to do that as often, we need to be able to, so or to make, for lack of a better term, let's also be making our business case. We have a great, you know, ethical and human case but let's also make our business case. So I just thought Kristen brought up some really good, a really good point there, because I think that really appeals to everyone, regardless of where you land on the political spectrum. So this is, this is an important segue because I don't think we can have any discussion actually over the next two days without talking about what the last year and a half has done to all of us, right? Done to our, our globe, our system, and then in the behavioral health space, you know, the things that we have seen. So I wanna open this to everyone. You know, when you think about these things that we're speaking of and also yourselves, how has the last year and a half COVID-19, and for me, we've always had a pandemic of social injustice, but it's obviously been brought to the forefront in the last year and a half in a way that I think was magnified because we were also isolated and forced to look at it via media and the things that were you know, traumatizing us on screen. So 
anybody, you know, how has it transformed your role? You know, how has it transformed the way you think about policy uh, or the way we can shape our future to really tackle these important issues that you're mentioning to dismantle inequity in our system? Kristen. <clears throat> So um, in many ways, when we talk about youth um, that are in our LGBTQ plus community, we know that oftentimes they're isolated. Um, and since COVID hit, they're even more isolated. So we had to have those conversations regarding what are we going to put in place? They can't, you know, at one point they weren't in school anymore. You know, they couldn't, you know, talk with the friends who made them comfortable, who they felt um, comfortable and open to talk with. They couldn't um, do that anymore. More. So with that, we did have to look at the way that we did business and the way that we were supporting um, our youth in that respect. So that alone was eye opening um, to us and just um, the mental health um, challenges that it caused um, our youth who identified as LGBTQ+. There are things that we didn't think of that COVID forced us um, to think about in, in a good way. Um, so there are a lot of things um, dealing with that, that we put in place, as well as just our staff, period. Um, we often talk about, you know, our children and the families that we serve, but we sometimes forget the staff who have to go out there on the front line and the secondary, you know, trauma that they're exposed to. So COVID has really brought a lot of things out in the forefront for our agency to make sure that even really before COVID that we should have had put in place, but this really put it on the forefront for us to put different strategies um, in place and tools just to make our work successful. Excellent point, excellent. And in what you said is huge, right? That there were things that we all should have been doing before that I think really were exposed, you know, in, in this moment. Dr. Martinez. <clears throat> Sorry, what, I, what I would add to that is, and what really came to bear for us is the Hog Foundation for Mental Health and the work we do across the state of Texas and even the work that I do um, uh, nationally. Um, and, and Kristen kind of pointed out, there was, a, there was already an epidemic, a mental health epidem epidemic in this country. Uh, and, and then we can deconstruct that into, you know, uh, for example, you know, the, the epidemic that we have when it comes to suicide a and, and different cohorts where now, you know, you have, you know, very young black men who have, are having an increase in suicide rates, which we hadn't seen before. So what's going on there? So that was pre-pandemic. We also had racism, long-standing issue in this country. But then COVID comes along, a pandemic that is hitting the entire world. But it's hitting, as we noticed, our populations of color even harder. 2020 was a terrible year. 2021 seems a little bit better because we now have at least a vaccine and all, but there's still so many issues to be addressed. But what it really came for us in an understanding is now what's known as a syndemic where you have epidemics coming together that are all coming and hitting populations of color really hard. And especially, uh, you know, um, uh, our, our Black communities, uh, our Native American communities, you know, Hispanic communities, A Asian American. I mean, it's almost like no one is spared, but it's because it elevated and, exacer and exacerbated and what the pandemic does, this virus doesn't care. It's just looking for a host. It doesn't mm -hmm. care what color you are, who you are. But if we already have pre-existing disparities, it just elevated and made them even more uh, uh, of an issue. And But what I think it also helped, and I think hopefully because of the social, the, the social justice movement uh, of last summer, it brought it to the attention of the entire public to help understand what is actually happening to our communities of color. Yes, yes, syndemic, and it's a powerful wor word. You know, I was I was thinking last month, like, what does it mean if you have an entire nation that is actually traumatized? Right? We talk about standardizing or federalizing trauma-informed care for everyone. There is not a single person who hasn't experienced some level of adversity in the last year. It's huge, David. <clears throat> So I, for me, it's really reinforced that uh, silence you know, does actually equal death in many instances, um, and that we can't be silent about racism and systemic equities, um, and we can't be silent about a system that doesn't meet people's needs in all communities. And I think too much of our advocacy is still frankly centered on kind of small changes to the status quo and you know, too focused, and I say this as a 
you know, someone who works on federal policy, too focused on kind of inside the beltway, you know, mindset. Um, and people in their communities are demanding change, and we need to force our political system to, uh, you know, to, to change in the way that they're, uh, we're, we're, they're demanding. Um, and unfortunately, we're too often kind of too constrained in our vision um, and aren't looking out broad enough about, you know, what is possible. And that means starting with prevention, you know, starting early in school-based mental health. Uh, in Mental Health America put out a great report uh, earlier this summer on all the state Medicaid programs that don't actually cover school-based mental health services in any meaningful way. They limit it to only to IEPs, which is very systemically inequitable because uh, it tends to be you know, white students who have IEPs, to be you know, quite frank about it. Um, and you know, we also appropriated $130 billion for schools, which was much needed, but none of that had to be dedicated for mental health services and supports. So schools are you know, kind of looking at trying to figure out what to do, but don't have the resources or technical assistance uh, for how to do that. And then finally, we just need to integrate uh, public health uh, and behavioral health together. The fact that they've been separated has really harmed us. And we need to make sure that uh, behavioral health is part of public health. You brought up you brought up a lot. I think a powerful statement: "Silence equals death." Right? That that is so huge, and it speaks to so many different parts of this allyship as well. What does it mean when communities that don't necessarily represent who we are, we speak on behalf of? We're able to speak for and advocate to say that this is something that's important and. The privileges that people have are disparate, right? We know that. So I think that that's very, very important. Um, Dr. Rory. <clears throat> the pandemic gave me hope. We now see all the holes, or we're willing to see all the holes that need to be filled. We need to start working on the next pandemic right now. We can't be afraid to discuss and find solutions for the ongoing civil unrest, racism, discrimination. We gotta come to terms on equity, health disparities, social determinants of health. We gotta integrate data collection, protocols, frameworks, research, policies, practice that are not only evidence-based, but community-based, peer-supported, lived experience. So that's what the pandemic did for me. It gave me hope. Like finally, we're willing to come out and say, not only is it a problem, but my advice, we get started on the next one right now. Prevention is key. Yep. Definitely, definitely. And, and what does it actually mean to be inclusive? You know, who do we think should be at the table? Um, who really hasn't always been at the table and yet we're making decisions for the lives of people. LaShawn. First of all, let me just say, I love Dr. Rory. <laughs> I love your energy. Um, for me, the pandemic certainly um, made crystal clear here in New York City, in our public school system, that mental health and wellness is a critical need for everyone, for everyone. Um, it's revealed the need for schools to be able to fully support the whole child in ways that we haven't before, including mental health and wellness. Because we would focus on physical health in some very clear ways, but not targeting mental health um, during the pandemic, we were able to prioritize communities hardest hit. Um, and, you know, we're talking about mental health equity is really about targeting communities most in need. Early on, these communities were identified um, based on a range of factors from um, mortality rates, case rates, uh, chronic illness, overcrowding, um, the number of individuals experiencing poverty, a lot of factors, pre-existing health disparities, and then mobilizing to support those communities in targeted ways um, in, in our school system that meant activating school crisis teams. That meant supporting adult cell. I agree, Kristen, exactly what you were saying. Like, how do we support the caregivers in a different way that we had never done before? 
we mobilized to train over 75,000 teachers and educators in trauma-informed care in ways that we had never done before. So the hope that you're talking about, Dr. Rory, like really taking advantage of this moment um, across our system, we had wellness checks for students and families. This year, we're implementing social emotional learning screeners and right it within our schools, like really bringing mental health and wellness and to every child in every classroom and then organizing ourselves accordingly to ensure a multi-tier system of support so that we're meeting the needs of children in real time. So we took advantage of this moment to meet the needs of our children and our educators and our families in different ways than we have in the past. And that's what this moment calls on. But we collectively cannot forget this moment. We cannot make this a thing of, of the past. We have to normalize mental health equity to support our most vulnerable children, our families and our educators alike. So I, I am looking at our time and this is a, a type of discussion, I'm sure, because we all eat, sleep and breathe this. And clearly, you know, our audience too is, is so engaged, um, but we could spend an entire day just talking about. So I, I totally know that. I, I think um, we had one question that I'm, I'm hopeful to be able to just answer as a group. You know, we had a lot of inquiry from our participants about someone who's not maybe in a clinical role or in a leadership role, who is just a community member. What can they do to advance mental health equity, right? And, we, and you all are experts at so many different levels of the way our society is reached. If you think about that, what would you tell someone? Octavio. <clears throat> Uh, two quick uh, points on that. Uh, number one, uh, like the Hogg Foundation, uh, we have and we're working with communities. Um, uh, we have a wellness and rural communities initiative as an example. We have five counties bringing them together to really uh, reach out to their historically excluded, uh, you know, members of their community and bring them to the table. So don't forget that your voice is important at everything that you could possibly do, even if it's just a PTA or you hear about a collaborative that's being put together raise your hand up and go and, and attend and participate. So that's at the local level. At the national level, I'm on the Health Equity Task Force for the Biden uh, Harris uh, COVID-19. We have our national meetings that are open to the entire public. We reach out and we do value and we listen to folks when they call in. Yes, you only get three minutes, but those, those are three valuable minutes where your voice can be heard. You can contact, you can, you can follow up with emails. This is going to the White House. This is going to the task force. So every person out there that is the US, you have that ability to call in and to participate. So I would just say, participate at every level. You can participate at the very local and you can even be calling in at the national and give us your opinion, give us your insight, as LaShawn said, give us your stories. They're so important. It helps then for those that are in positions that are being asked to make decisions on behalf of the rest of us be much more informed and understand what's happening at the community level and at the personal level even. Yes, absolutely. Dr. Rory, we'll take our final comment from you. <clears throat> it starts with you. How do you want to be treated? How do you want your mom, your dad, your sister, your pets, how do you want to be treated? That's it. You know you want to be treated fair. You want to be treated like royalty. That's how it starts. It starts with you. Volunteer in your passion. What are you good at? Basketball, singing, reading, math. Start with your passion. Mentor somebody. It's one conversation. And then see that just blossom into something beautiful. That's what I'll say. And thank you all have been phenomenal. I have held back the tears. This has been so emotionally charging in a good way for me. And I hope everybody on the planet watches this segment. It will be life changing. Thank you all. What an amazing and enriching discussion. I All of these topics, as I said, is something we could devote an entire symposium to. We had some questions we couldn't get to in the chat. I do apologize. I want to say to our, our participants, 
It's a lot of follow-up planned from this. You know, this is an inaugural moment for here for us here at the Kennedy Satcher Center. So please know that your questions are being recorded um, and, and noted, and so we can find ways to answer them for you. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for your openness, for your candor, for your humanity, for most importantly, being champions of equity in your roles. And in, in this movement, um, I could not do my job without your collaboration, but I also know that the world would not be what it is without your presence in it. So to our, to our participants, um, we will take a short break here for lunch. Uh, we will reconvene for panel number two, beginning at one o'clock. Um, but thank you all so much. It was such a pleasure. <laughs>